times or maybe it was five times. It's all fuzzing together at this point. I've always forgotten to do that until later. Um, but we're recording this now and we're getting those up on YouTube um, afterwards, so that's good. I'm finally gotten my act together well enough to do that. Welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. As I scroll through our list of attendees, I think that just about all of you have been here before. Um, in the case that you have forgotten, this is a responsive session um, on the theme of assessment. Um, on the activity sheet, I have curated and assembled a whole bunch of um, resources on assessment, um, best, best, uh, best emerging practices, um, just a note on that phrase. I don't believe there is a best practice for just about anything, um, but there are some things that work better than others, and there is never an ultimate like we've reached the best. We will never get better. Um, we're always improving. So emerging good practices um, are assembled and curated on the activity sheet. Take a look, help yourself, and dig in. Uh, let's see. I have stopped sharing the slides. That's good. No, I have not. Stop sharing the slides now. All right. Welcome, everybody. So, let me now again share what is on the activity sheet. And there we are, improve assessments. It's a it's kind of a fun a fun thing to be in the position where we can every week sort of jump into a conversation and say, hey, what have you been learning? What what are you facing? Um, what are the, the the circumstances that you're operating under? And how are your students reacting? And when we talk about assessments, we're talking about a very stressful um, sort of part of the instructional process, right? Where um, as instructors, we're worried, did we ask them the right questions? Are we wasting their time? Um, will, will there be a lot of complaints and emails that I'll have to answer? Uh, will people be arguing about, you know, percentages of points that they feel that they should have gotten? For students, of course, the stress is in some ways the opposite of that. Um, have I learned enough? Did I learn the right stuff? Um, have I prepared enough? Um, are these questions even fair? I don't remember this or that or the other thing. So assessment is that sort of, in some ways it's controversial because of all of these uh, different angles that we're, we're approaching them from. Um, I would say in general, one of the best things that we can do is make assessments as surprise free and expected as possible. And that means um, communicating loudly, over communicating, um, basing them on the outcomes of the course. So from the get go of this course, I've said we're going to look at boom, 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 and here it is. We're looking at boom and next week we're going to look at boom, boom, and the third week we're going to look at boom, 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 right? Or whatever those are. Having every activity that we do refer back to, remember we're talking about this learning outcome right now or this goal, and I'm assessing you on that. And this way the students won't be surprised because it's like, oh yeah, I know that. Our instructor has been talking about that forever now, so it's old hat for us. Um, I've got four sort of overview uh, takeaways, if you will. The outcomes was the big one. Making assessments authentic is the next one, and this one's really kind of tricky because as much as we try to say, oh, this is just like you're going to be assessed in real life, realistically it's not. Uh, the context is different, and I guess I talk about that in the student experience here as well because we're in a learning situation and we have to be in a learning situation. So we're not in a performance only situation. We're in a situation where 
we're being graded. We're coming here to learn. The expectation is that we don't already know. You know, we weren't hired because we know our stuff. We were hired in this case and as a student to learn the stuff. So it's all training and no performance in some ways. So we have to sort of respect that difference. It's not authentic in that way. We're in a classroom rather than in an immersive environment, right? Oftentimes um, the context is often different. Um, more often than not, our assessments, we expect our students to do their work alone, right? Take the exam by yourself. Don't look up the answers. Don't ask other students the answers. But in many of our professional practices, authentically, when we have a question and we don't know the answer, we turn to our colleagues and we say, hey, I forgot this, or help me. What did we talk about this? What's the best way to do this from your experience? And we have these dis very collaborative discussions. So that's how we perform. We aren't sort of more often than not. We're not told answer this question um, without looking left or right, without looking up or down, without asking anybody else. Um, and you have, you know, two minutes to answer this question. That's not realistic in most of our professions. If it is realistic for the profession that you're um, teaching, for the discipline that you're um, teaching in, then by all means, that makes sense. Make it authentic. All right, and that's that one. That's that's tricky, and that's that's a hard one. For, and and I expect and I want pushback and pullback on that because um, it's something about the tradition of instruction, uh, formal instruction, college, high school, grade school. You know, throughout, um, we've really been socialized that cheating means asking colleagues for help. Cheating means um, using the resources that we have to look up answers. Todd, go ahead. Thanks, John. I, I love this line of thinking. And, and have you thought much about um, how to um, make explicit the ways in which instructors are collaborating or are colleagues with students? Right, because it, there's a there's a really inauthentic way of doing that, saying, oh, "I'm a physicist, and you too are physicists," and that's simply not true in all yet. advanced graduate courses. And so, right. I mean, have, have you thought about um, sort of working with instructors or in your own practice of of helping students see in what ways you are their colleague and 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 collaborating with them? Yeah, this is in many ways. Um, Everybody's heard of Bloom's cognitive taxonomy, right? Where we talk about remembering and understanding and and um, all the way up to like creating and evaluating, synthesizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In this, he also did a taxonomy called the affective uh, domain, right? Where it's do I just respond or um, what are the? It's respond and value, uh, and then eventually you you know do you see the world through that lens? And when you start to see the world through the lens of whatever discipline, that, you know, a professional in whatever discipline you're in, then you're at that level of the graduate student or the doctoral student or, you know, the professional um, who can be your colleague. But until then, we're trying to get students to, to respond to something that they may not care about. When they do start to value it, now they start moving from the outside looking in to being part of the inside and start to see, OK, this is valuable enough. I value this personally enough to start thinking in this domain like that. At that point. That's a great win for for us as instructors, because if we get a couple of students who start to value that. They will model it to others. They can share what inspires them and what makes them value it with the other students. Um, they're easy students to guide because oftentimes they start digging in on their own. Um, and that's that's what our professional colleagues do in a lot of ways, right? We're in this. In the positions that we're in because we valued them and we've dedicated enough of our lives that we start to identify identify as. People in the field, people who see the world through uh, the epistemic frames of. An educator of a physicist of. A, literary scholar, etc. 
but yeah, do you have ideas on that? Or does anyone else have ideas on on how do we get our students to that point um, where it does start to become easier and where they start looking at those assessments from the lens of, well, if I'm going to be in this profession, here's the way that I would look at it. And if you want to use the chat, you can use the chat. If you want to uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself, feel free to do that and jump right in. It's fair game and it's a small enough group that we don't have to. Um, I don't even think we need to raise our hands necessarily. I guess I already talked about communicating um, the outcomes and the reasons for us. Uh, uh, not, not the reasons, but the. Um, the expectations of the assessment and making and using a rubric is a really great way to help the students understand what was it that I'm supposed to do? What was it that I'm supposed to learn? Um, and if we can, if they can do that, um, that removes a lot of the cognitive load of trying to guess what does the instructor want here? And you know, students do that all the time. They try to decode us and figure out what makes us tick and what will we like and what will we not like. And we can help them by just telling them with a rubric. Here are the things that I'm looking for. Um, this is the way that I want you to think about X, Y or Z or whatever that we're talking about. All right, those are the four over uh, four points in my overview. If somebody has a fifth point, I uh, think that, that they think is important. I encourage you to just jump right in there and add it. Um, we can do that. It's editable. Uh, we've got some questions here that are starting to happen. I'm going to scroll past them for now and uh, point out that each of those four points above are. Developed in some ways farther below. Um, so let course goal, goals drive assessment is the learning outcomes one. Um, and then there are some different ways uh, to do some some of these things and different ideas uh, using rubrics again. I would be remiss if I don't always talk about equ equity and using universal design uh, for learning, providing options. Uh, there are a lot of alternatives uh, that we don't even have to jump into, like how do I make my exam better? We can take the question one step deeper, one step back and simplify and say, do I need an exam? Or can I have a series of quizzes? Um, can I get my students to ask those questions? Um, which is a great metacognitive exercise for them, by the way, right? Because we start giving them more of the responsibility, uh, allowing them to take on more of the responsibility of their, of, of their learning. Um, they get to reflect on what would a good quiz question be? Um, they can share them with you. You pick out the best one. You change it around a little bit. And when the student who whose questions were picked um, sees their question, uh, they'll be like, oh, cool. This is the question. I still have to answer it because they've changed it, but I know the thinking behind it. So that's kind of a, a nice reward for that. Um, is it authentic in our discipline to have? Questions or uh, problems that we get to check our resources for, you know, look at the world. Um, can I present my knowledge in a way that um, makes more sense than answering a question? Um, or can I answer the question with a slide or a demonstration? Um, can we do some research and put together collaboratively without the whole class uh, an annotated anthology or, or, or uh, bibliography? Fact sheets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's much more down there. And then we've got some assessment strategies. And then on the bottom, um, honor lock is a very popular uh, topic of conversation in assessment at UW Madison these days, and we've got the official word on that. And then uh, just a sort of reminder to make the student centered assessment choices, right? So assessment, remember, is about the students learning, not about primarily our teaching, although we do get feedback on our teaching through assessments. So keep their experience in mind. 
any thoughts on or questions on what we've talked about so far, what I've talked about so far, and I've done too much talking, so I will invite others to jump in again. Um, raise your hand, jump into chat, and we'll start talking about what's on the activity sheet here in just a second. But I want to give people a, a, a quick moment to raise their hand while I take a sip. All right, moving on from the overview then, let's look at the table and unpack this. Um, how are we or might we communicate with students about the purpose and values of a given assessment or the assessments within a course? Great, I have not looked at the stuff on the left on the right yet, so as I do that, I want to point out this part here, the purposes and the values. As Todd and I were talking about earlier, that affective domain of responding, valuing, um, seeing the world through the lens of uh, somebody in our discipline or the epist epistemic frames, I think is what the, the edu edu babble um, phrase for that. That's great when that happens. Until they have that on their own, sometimes they have to sort of, they need help in getting that, right? So it's up to us to communicate that. There are so many ways to do that. As instructors, if we communicate our personal story, one, it's personal. So it's not just a, this is important, but it's a, in my experience, this was important for me because concrete, you know, story and example of, of some struggles that I had. Um, and how this field solved that problem or addressed the struggles that I had, right? That's one example, but it doesn't have to just be you. Bring in voices from past students saying, I thought this was a bunch of BS until this happened and now I see the value of it. And now I see the purpose of it. Um, the students will listen to past students more than they will sometimes listen to you because the past students look and feel like they do. They sound like they do. And we often look a little bit different, right? Because we're older, uh, because we have more experience, because uh, we're experts in our field and not novices necessarily like our students, some of our students are. You can also bring in experts from um, outside the university, right? Not students, but professionals, the kinds of students that you're, the kinds of people that your students feel like they want to someday be and say, you know, from outside, get a quick little video of your colleague saying, oh, this part is really important and that's that unit, or this part is really important because, and that's that unit. So it's not just your voice, but it's your voice amplified by others, both previous students and uh, other folks from the field, uh, your colleagues. All right, let's see what our panel of experts, um, you all said about this. All right, I have this question too. Oh, it's not an answer. Because sometimes students complain about being uh, something being busy work when I think it has a really important purpose. All right, so explicit statements, great. The purpose of this activity is, I take that even a step further. Um, when I have reflective questions at the end of assessments or activities, I'll say, um, two weeks ago, the perp, you know, I had you do X because I wanted you to learn da 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 da. da. There's the reason right there. Did you learn it, or how did you learn it, or what could I have done to help you learn da 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 da, da, da better? And that way, I'm reminding them over and over again. This was the point. Did you get the point? This was the point. How can I get the point better? Can I get the point? Which was this you know, to you one more, you know, even more effectively. And every time they see that, the synapses go a little bit deeper, right? And they start saying, oh, okay, I think I'm starting to get the point now. So that, I think those explicit statements really help. And there's an agreement. Citing the learning objectives, there it is. It's a bigger purpose. 
All right, and I love this because this helps us. It helps us as well. It doesn't just help the students understand this is why we're doing it, but the more we remind ourselves of it, the more we can weed out and say, oh, this activity was I thought was really cool, but come to think of it, it might not be important enough to spend the amount of time that we're spending on it because it doesn't connect with our learning um, outcomes that we're looking for. Angela, go ahead. Hi, um, thanks. As we as you were chatting and reading through people's comments there, I was also thinking about how this is where like structure for your overall course can really help, um, which is a harder thing to like do in the short term. But, you know, having it such that if you have activities, you know, they're linked to an assessment that's coming up and that's sort of either built in somewhere where it's visible or maybe you know, when you release content for that week, you make a note like, oh, this is going to lead into this. And so helping students find ways to like make those connections that we see like, oh, obviously we're going to do this writing activity because you have a writing assignment like yeah. that. We're doing this to support you so that that thing that's coming later is less painful um, might be another way to kind of think about not just reminding them in the moment or in assignments, but finding ways to like make it kind of explicit in the design could help too. This and if the students know why they're doing the things that they're doing, that just helps so much with the, the motivation. Um, and this reminds me of a story I heard. Um, Jim G used to talk about video games and learning and at a conference one year, some participant asked him. Um, I want to make things, you know, my teaching more fun like video games. How do I make them more fun like video games um, so that the students are more engaged? And he like got up and was very adamant that video games aren't necessarily fun. They are engaging. Um, but most of the work that we do in the video games is the grind, right? There's a fun thing. We see a problem up here that we want to get to. And we recognize that in order to get the skills that are necessary to kill the boss at the level or to, to get past the level, we need to do all of this other stuff and work through that and doing that can take hours and it can be tedious and it can be not fun at all, but it's engaging because it's driven by our, our motivation to get to this point and solve that difficult problem that we desperately want to solve. Wanting to solve a problem desperate enough that we are willing to get to do all, to do all of these things to get to that point. That's cool and that is something that I think that Education as instructors, we should strive for figuring out how to crack that nut, but we haven't yet, or at least I haven't yet, um, and I haven't seen really good examples of it. So I challenge you to think about how do we communicate? How do we show them this like really cool, difficult problem to solve and say this is really cool. You're going to really like this fun. Frustrating problem. Um, and get them intrigued enough that they will go through that the grind, the tedium of all that drill in practice in order to get to the point where they can have the opportunity to solve that problem. Good. All right, I wonder about helping set a, a student expectations around difficulty or the experience. If this is really easy for you or if this is really hard for you. All right, yeah, this is um, in some ways this is differentiated, right? So some students will be really good at it. And if that's the case, how can you make it a little bit more difficult for them? Um, or how can they make it more difficult for themselves? When I think about this, I think about billiards. I can play somebody in billiards and if they're really good, I will do my best to beat them and I will try to play better than I can. If they're really terrible and I am could beat them so quickly, then I'll make little rules for myself like, OK, every shot that I have to do is going to be a bank shot. Right, so now it becomes a more of a challenge for me, but it sort of levels the playing field because it's sort of a self imposed um, constraint on myself that helps me become a better player while still sort of making the game fun for both people. Um, so I, I like this question. How do we set those student expectations on that? Any other ideas? Todd says hand. 
go ahead. Oh, that was Angela's hand. Uh, sure, I think that Peter was... actually had a hand up. Oh, okay, um, Peter. Thank you. You know, I wanted to add, I, I, you know, because in my experience, it has, you know, like over the last two semesters teaching remotely, it has been invaluable to spell out in writing the objectives and the the purposes of what you want them to learn. You know, because it seems to me, you know, like that was kind of like in the in-person environment, it's automatic, you know, like you say, okay, I want you to do this and this because of that and that. But you know, people in the remote environment kind of like it's it's easy to miss you saying something. And so then later on, you know, when they're doing the assignment or what whatever, you know, I think I I have gotten very um, good positive feedback from the students and saying, we, I really like that you put explicitly in the assignment what you wanted us to do and why it, why you wanted us to do it. You know, so that I mean, I think multiple modalities communicating the effectiveness of of things is is invaluable. And I see Julie emphasize or Angela emphasizing that with the short video because you're right. We miss a lot in this mediated, you know, video mediated format or the asynchronous um, digital format. There's a lot that and we're feeling, you know, isolated and remote right now, and we miss a lot of what's happening outside of our walls. So any other optional ways that we can make those explicit are great. Todd, go ahead. No, and I since Peter was talking, right, something that I know is part of his practice is not only is he making this explicit, but at the beginning of the course, he is he is trying to create opportunities for students to say, who am I in this course? Right. Am I someone going into physical therapy? Am I someone going into and I've watched faculty in massive gen ed courses do essentially the same thing, right? Not saying to students, you're going to be a philosopher, yep. but actually making space for them to think about um, how is this course fitting into uh, my education? And then when it comes to the assessment, they come back and riff on that. Kind of, so it, it, for me, John, it's tethered to what you're saying about think about the student experience. Yeah. Because if you can't, make space for them, and this is really what G is really interested in, right? If you can't create identities for them in your space, they're going to fall back on what they've got, which is they'll be a student. Yep. And students ask, how many points is this worth? And how do I get the most points for the least possible effort, right? And that's smart if your identity is a student. And so it's really interesting. It's become more interesting to me, the thing that, oh, I think Cross and Daniel call it a... Um, uh, background knowledge probe, or that's the language that floats around, but really thinking about how are we surveying early, um, not simply to know who students are, but also to help them think about who they are. I think that pays yeah. when it comes to assessment. Yeah, how can this benefit you regardless of what field you're in? In, in some ways, this is bringing the ideas of a liberal education back into the discussion of the classroom whatever your discipline is. So you might be in um, physical therapy or kinesiology, and I might be an English student, but are there things that I can learn that will help me as my in my identity through your, uh, you know, by seeing things through your eyes or through the lens of, of people um, in your area? That's I love that. Ask the students, ask them to make that connection and you know, don't ask them. Is there a connection? Say, think about it. Make up a connection if you need to make up a connection, but think about like what possible connection can I have? Challenge them to do that. Um, I think that's that's good. Yeah, making making space for them wherever they're at. I like that. All right, shall we move on to the next one? All right, the question is or the, uh, the comment is pressure to assign all assessments for all people. Um, so this is the uh, if I'm reading this right, one multiple choice exam experience. One research paper, one presentation, um, and that is the idea that, um, oh my gosh, as an instructor, if I'm going to do something for everybody, then how do I do this? How do I how do I survive 
creating 20 different assessments for 20 different students in my class who are all different and all want different thing. Yeah, Julie, John. Yeah, yeah okay. this was so this is something I posted. It's something that has been popping up a little bit more in um, my instructional support meetings. Um, it's coming from the world of psychology, I actually had a, a faculty member once who told me about uh, armchair psychologists who learn just enough to be dangerous, right? To make dangerous conclusions or assumptions. And so I'm actually seeing this a little bit in popping up in instruction where folks like looked at a universal design chart and took what they took and have decided, okay, so that means I need to assign one high stakes exam, one high stakes paper, one high stakes presentation and provide essentially zero scaffolding, right? So one example, uh, an instructor, um, you know, assigned this major multiple choice assessment at the end of the semester, but assigned nothing but papers leading up to it. And so, you know, what was the formative assessment to prepare them for that final summative assessment? And um, so I guess I just wanted to bring it up with this group as, as a, a team of folks who are around campus and, um, you know, might have their ear to the ground a little bit more and, and can, you know, help address this situation or have ideas or suggestions. Yeah. And universal design doesn't necessarily mean that everybody needs to have their own, you know, boutique assessment created specifically for them. Um, it just means that it's using multiple modalities. Um, if instead of just one exam, you know, one thing, you give them a choice of two things, you've already doubled their options. Um, and it, you know, one might be easier for somebody or tie more carefully into um, the background knowledge that they come to class with or their experiences or their values or their skills. And they might say, wow, I've got some skills in this. So even if I don't know a lot about the topic, I can use my skills that I have here and use that lens to dig in more. Um, because, you know, there's something that relates to me about this assessment that I can connect to versus, oh my gosh, I didn't know how to write a paper and I don't know how anything about the topic. I'm just totally lost on that and that will feel overwhelming. At least I've got something that I can hang on to. And that, that connection is sometimes all the confidence that they need to be able to stand on that solid foundation and now dig in and find the things that work for them. Um, so I think that it's again, that's so important to be able to make that connection. And it doesn't take a lot. Um, another way that I've seen this done is with rubrics that are broad enough that say, you know, share three ideas, share three citations, you know, supporting your idea um, or ideas. Um, you, know, you know, three pros, three cons. I don't care what the format is. So the rubric is about did you communicate the ideas rather than did you spell all the words right? Did you um, use Times New Roman 12 point, you know, font with inch and a half borders? Um, it's it gives them the choices to present their knowledge in whatever way. You don't have to design it. You just have to design the rubric that lets them then go in and do the hard work of instruction and learning, which we want them to do because they're adult learners. Um, they're trying to figure out how to do this on their own, right? So let's let them, let's unleash them, let's get out of their way. Um, and um, with our with our preconceived notions of this is what assessments look like. Any feedback on that? Somebody itching to say, but John. <laughs> no, I'm just gonna yes and and say that Laura Schmidley uh, posted a choose your own adventure idea. Um, and I know you and I have talked about this in the past, but that's such a fun assignment. And if you have, if you have room or space in your course to build something like that, especially something that can progress over time throughout the semester, um, it can be a wonderful experience for both you and your students. I know I've done it a few times and it's a lot of fun. 
yeah, I, and you can even have students design those choose your own adventures um, and say, you know what? How would you do this? So it's not a you know, you don't have to do the. And this might be what Laura was saying, uh, so I'll invite her to jump in and, and explain a little bit more, but um, you don't have to write the choose your own adventure book. You can have the students write the choose your own adventure book. Am I getting that right, Laura? I think so. Yeah, John, I, I've I'll just add that. Um, I've seen this work well. I've done it actually in graduate level courses where I feel a little bit more comfortable in sort of this, the skills and inclinations students are bringing in. So it's harder for me to think about it with, with less experienced students. And I guess the way to be more responsible with how you're supporting them in kind of the options. But um, yeah, I think what you're what you and Julia both described is is what I'm thinking of too. It's it can be um, I think it, it takes a few iterations to get it right when you're thinking sure. about aligning all of these things, which can be tricky. Um, but if you have the opportunity to try that out with like a smaller enrollment course or a course with more advanced students, it, it can be a really um, powerful thing, I think. Yeah, and if that's you know, if it is the case where getting it right is difficult, which it probably is, um, make that part of it worth fewer points and then say, oh, and there's also this reflective piece where the reflection can be any form you want, but it's that's, you know, did it work? How well did it work? How could it have worked better? What worked well about it? What didn't work well about it? Like if they can talk about that on the metacognitive level, then you know that they're understanding this or they're not. And the reflection can be worth a few more points. Todd, it looks like you're going to say something. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to um, follow up on what Laura was talking about in, in working with a big class that was working with the design lab. Staff there were really clear that it's great for you to provide options, but then really to Julie's point, scaffold them. And we're noticing, right, and this is from their staff, that if you say do anything you want, you have created paralysis for students. But if you say here are four things people kind of do to do this sort of thing, and we have support materials that will walk yep. you through doing each of them, yep. right? It, it tends to lead to a higher quality project that, um, or better said, it's going to lead to a project that actually exhibits the learning that right an instructor is hoping to assess right as they get to the end of it. Yeah, students often need the models to look at, right? Because without the models, they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what my instructor's expectations are. So just give me, you know, the one thing. If you want me to look at to do a paper, that's I've got paper down. I've got writing a paper down. I've seen lots of models of that. But to do anything beyond that, that's uncharted territory. And what if it's not the thing that my instructor wants? So if you can say, start off simple, right? write a paper or if you feel so inclined do something else. Most people write the paper, right? A couple of brave students might say, OK, we're going to do that other thing. Great. Some of them are great. Some of them are not great. Take the great ones. Next year, use the, that as a model. Do a paper. Here's a model. Do this other thing. Here's a model from last year that my student did or do a third thing, right? And so we're slowly building up these models that the students can look to and say, that one looks like that'll fit. All of them fit within the rubric that we've decided um, assesses the things that we want them to know about. So that's a you're really good point about if you don't scaffold that, if you don't give them models, then they they won't do it. It's too scary. It's an unknown world. So great. Low stakes, great. And decreasing, yeah, changing that up helps people. And and again. Um, in, in some way, this idea is again multiple means. So one mean could be the quiz this week and the quiz next week instead of the one exam that's worth everything. Multiple small things. That's an interpretation of multiple means of, of uh, expression. Okay. Hey, John, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Um, I think you may have skipped over a, a really fun comment that someone posted about I, having a group component of quizzes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I was just looking at that thinking that I just missed that. Yeah, you want to talk about that? Um, so Laura also posted uh, about that, um, and actually I think someone else 
posted the original comment, um, I can give them space to speak first. Hey, that was my comment um, based on the question about if there are any changes to assessment that you made that you're thinking of carrying on regardless of if you're like back in person or remote. And so, yeah, with I used to have four or five actually paper based quizzes that was, you know, you get an hour, take the quiz, we collect the quiz and, you know, I think students always got pretty stressed about that. They still get stressed in the online environment, but it's a much more open. There's like a 36 hour period. Um, once they start the quiz, there is a four hour timer, but it's not meant to take four hours. It's just to like, so they're not spending their whole lives on this. Um, it should ideally take 30 to 60 minutes, but essentially it's open notes, open whatever, and it's having them create something like, you know, here's some parameters, design an experiment, or here's uh, some data to analyze, you know, create a figure based on that data and then talk about it. So it's definitely a lot more open, and I think it's allowing students to like practice what they've learned in a different way. It's a lab course. Um, but I am thinking I'd like to find some kind of happy medium where I've always played with this idea of doing group quizzes. I've heard about it from a lot of people and this idea like you take something independently, you do the, the quiz kind of on your own, get your ideas out and then get together with a group and kind of rehash it and maybe turn in like a separate version that the group uh, agreed upon. Um, and I think Julie made a comment about like how you could potentially grade that. But that's definitely something I've been like thinking about for years. And now I feel like I have a nice medium or set of questions that I could modify into something that's a little beyond just like your memorized stuff. Um, and then I would probably have them be able to access their notes during the second, you know, group project. So really they could actually put together a, a more final answer for that part. Great. And this idea of, of not a plain old paper quiz and giving the students a little bit more um, agency in those quizzes makes me also remember a um, an example where we had an instructor who would assign quizzes, say every quiz question is worth five points, but students, it's up to you. If it's a multiple choice quiz, for example, easy to grade, you can say I am absolutely sure that the answer is A and I'm going to bet five points on that. Or you can say I think it's A, but I'm not positive, so I'm going to bet three points on A and two points on B because it's either A or B, right? Or you can say I don't know what it is, so one point on A, one point on B, one point on C, one point on D, one point on E, you know, and that way I'll win at least one point but I'll lose four points. So it's kind of a, it adds this gambling sort of um, wager amount on it, which in some ways, you know, there's a cost to getting it wrong. So you're not, you know, losing everything, but you're not losing everything. Um, unless you bet all on five and it's actually you know, on A and it's actually D, then you've lost everything. But that that too says, you know, there's a great metacognitive um, exercise because it's not just what is the answer, but how certain am I of this answer? You know, and that causes you to know, think about like, well, I learned this and and yes, I remember that that day we talked about this, this and this, and I'm positive that that was there. So you're thinking back to what are the what are the elements uh, of this? All right, and Todd's got Barclay and Major um, with their thoughts on and it's it's a, a learning assessment technique number nine awesome fantastic and kate's done it as well good all right well so there's an idea 11 things that you've learned about assessments today and thank you julie for pointing out that i totally missed this whole question um i want to open it up to anyone else in the room here what other things have you decided that you're going to change based on what you've learned this last year And I can add a long pause for that because we only have one question left. We have 10 minutes, nine minutes. And, and I know I just uh, shared, but as I was re-looking at the question, I was thinking I 
in the in-person version, students do like uh, pair presentations at the end of the semester, and we've transitioned to doing a video so that the pair makes a video, and then we have little watch parties essentially where a facilitator plays the videos and then we like go through questions. So I just had the thought like maybe that would be an option for students if they're particularly they really don't like public speaking but feel more comfortable with making a video. They could submit their video presentation ahead of the live presentations and then we would still play the presentation potentially with the whole group. But that might be uh, something I could at least offer to students and you know maybe everyone would do it live. Maybe some people would want to do the video. Um, but yeah, I guess that's that's another thing I just thought about. <laughs> Excellent and and get their permission to save those recordings um, so that you can show them next year as models of last year. I had some students do this example, example, example. It's an option for you to try. Kate. Um, so I teach a, a class on pharmacy law and one of the assignments we do is we have our students do a real continuing education program that a licensed pharmacist would do and uh, we just say hey pick out something or last year we gave them the article and we did all the work of building it in canvas and picking what we thought were the right answers and setting hard deadlines if you have to do this before the speaker comes in and uh this year no that's that's a lot of work so this year we said we don't care which CE you do. They're all approved. Here's a list of free ones. You pick what you want to do, and then you just show us the certificate that you passed it. So super easy auto grading, uh, pertains to student interests, uh, really flexible deadlines. So. Oh, you muted up somehow. Are other people still hearing her? Kate, we can't hear you anymore. Uh oh, are you able to hear me? <laughs> OK. All right. Oh, yeah, my back. phone failed. <laughs> Owens. Oh. Sorry, we heard you right after super easy uh, to grade auto grading. Yeah. That's where the buzzing started. Yeah, so super easy to grade. Um, it pertains to student interests. We didn't, you know, we have a really flexible deadline. So um, I think on all fronts, it was definitely a much improved assessment, um, both from the student perspective and from our perspective. Do you then have them come in and do any sort of summary of their courses for the other students so that they can do some like some jig sign of like, this one I took and I passed it and so that's you know plus one for me but also for you for your information here are the best things that I learned from it here's what I would suggest for it so mm -hmm. it builds that sort of cohort um jig sign you know I I hadn't thought about that part it's it's a class that has no discussion sections or small groups. It was intended to just be one big lecture and that's all you get. So we've been very creative with how we use that time and, and build engagement. Um, but I love that idea. At a minimum, we could ask students, hey, how was your CE? Would you recommend this to other yeah. students? And then we can kind of curate a better list for next year. So I like that. Yeah, and the students then would appreciate not having having somebody else review something before they jumped into it mm -hmm. as a like wow this you know this sucked away worse than i thought it would you know by reading the description of it somebody's gone through it already and can recommend the ones the good ones excellent i like it okay good all right how do we create a culture that in engaged in class discussion is essential to the success of a course without having to police this by taking attendance, attaching points to everything, etc. All right, I'm going to go through the ideas before I give you mine. Uh, let's see the structured Google worksheet, structured Google uh, slide idea, so that there's some evidence of effort. I think that that's really useful for students too, because otherwise they'll get into a group and they don't know how to proceed. Uh, they don't know what other people are going to be like. This gives them some like work to do while they make these relationships uh, in their small group. And it helps guide that. Um, so for the first couple of times that you do this, 
yeah, give them the guidance. Eventually, if they're in the same small group, they're going to learn to build relationships with each other and they won't need as much structure and they can go beyond, I think, um, sort of the, the highly structured activity into a less structured activity. All right, and I love this as well. Um, how awful was that activity? <laughs> My head hurts. Um, great, because that helps you. But again, it also reminds it brings up that activity that the memory of that activity and what they learned in their head again, which is revisiting, which is that distributed um, learning rather than masked learning. Every time we get our students to think back about what they learned helps them learn that better. So I'm, I'm a big fan of reflection questions. And they're sneaky, right? As somebody said, uh, Laura said earlier, sneaky evaluation questions. Um, I like the who else came up with that. And good, you don't have to monitor that everyone responds, um, but you should be in those discussion groups a little bit just so they see your presence in there and they can see that it feels monitored um, and that, I don't know, that's um, perhaps kind of Foucault-ish, but uh, I don't know. I It's sometimes useful to be more productive if we know that we're being watched a little bit, um, but not overly watched. Another idea, a la carte menu uh, of ways to earn participation points. So great, it's kind of a, in some ways, a choose what works best for you. Um, pick the menu items that you want. And, you know, when we give students choices, they often surprise us. Uh, and I like this by going above and beyond. And especially at first it'll take some policing, um, but the more you do it and the more the students get used to that, I think students appreciate um, being given the agency to learn the way that works well for them, but they don't always know that, right? So structure at first, less structure um, as, as required later. All right. And there's a hope here, so it's not the jury's still out about how well it works. All right, and the last thought was I co-taught a grad class recently and watched a lovely discussion unfold. Um, and undergraduate undergraduates need to learn how to do that. Yes. Um, great. Uh, kudos to the discussion project. Um, if you're an instructor and you haven't gone through that yet, I hear good things. They don't let me take it because even though I teach in the fall, I apparently I don't teach enough. Sad face. Um, so yeah, do that. And the fishbowl activity, and there's a, a knowledge base resource on that, and I believe that we have video of that. Julie, you were, you were helped to make that, right? And how to do a fishbowl even in a remote instruction. Is that right? Yes. Yep. I will find the link and share it. Oh, it's in here, I think. Oh, you have it? Uh, yes, fishbowl discussion, remote instruction. Perfect. There it is. And there's a video example. Dun, da, da, da. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right. Hey, um, our time is up. We've got one minute left. Any last thoughts from people? Angela has uh, make an infographic or slide. Yes. That's for the for Kate. Good. Yeah, a, a simple summary. A simple graphical summary. Good. Other thoughts on this topic, this theme. If you would like to go into more depth about how do I do this in my class, in your class, um, come back tomorrow. Generally, Thursdays are way less populated. We've gone through most of the stuff today. Um, so tomorrow from one to two, um, you can meet back with me here and we can figure out how to do this, answer more specific questions if you'd like. Thank you all for coming today. Um, thank you especially for um, Todd and Laura and Julie and others who helped share, um, create the activity sheet um, and build into that. Um, and thank you again for all jumping in today. I appreciate it very much. See you next time. And I actually have a meeting 
right now. Usually I stick around for a few more minutes afterwards, but I've got a two o'clock meeting that was scheduled today. So if you'd like to continue talking, um, please feel free. I don't if I leave, do I close the meeting? I don't know. Or can you keep on meeting? Well, if the meeting gets closed, come back tomorrow. <laughs>